Hello and welcome everyone to the Leuven seminar in classical German philosophy. I'm very pleased to introduce today our speaker, Professor Huaping Lu Adler. She is Associate Professor of Philosophy at Georgetown University in Washington, DC. She has published numerous articles and book chapters on Kant's logic, on the history of logic, and more recently, on Kant's metaphysics and philosophy of science. I'll name just a few of her many recent publications. Uh, Kant and the Pr Principle of Sufficient Reason, which is an article published in the Review of Metaphysics uh, this month. Uh, Ontology as Transcendental Philosophy, a chapter in Kant's Lectures on Metaphysics, a Critical Guide, edited by Courtney Fugate in 2018, and Kant and the Normativity of Logic in the European Journal of Philosophy in 2017. And her book is titled Kant and the Science of Logic, a Historical and Philosophical Reconstruction, which came out with Oxford University Press in 2018. And her talk today is titled Kant on Lazy Savagery Racialized. I'm looking forward very much to hearing it. Um, Professor Lou Adler, over to you. Okay, great, thank you. Can everybody hear me all right? Yes, okay, great. All right, uh, let me play from the start. Okay, thank you, Steve, for that very generous introduction. And many thanks to Karen for inviting me and to you all for coming. It's a great honor to be here. I really, really look forward to the discussion. This is a relatively new area I'm working on. <clears throat> okay, as you can tell from the title of my presentation, I'll be talking about Kant's views on race. Let me begin with a partial overview of the state of research on this topic. Most scholars today, when asked, would acknowledge that Kant held racist views, but there is little agreement about whether he retained his racism through the end of his career or about what implications his racism may have for his philosophy as a whole. Pauline Kleingeld, in her well-known seminal essay, Kant's Second Thoughts on Race, argues that Kant did in fact abandon racism and become more egalitarian with regard to race around 1795. This change of mind, according to Kleingeld, is, not clear, is most clearly reflected in Kant's condemnations of colonialism and slavery in the perpetual peace and the metaphysics of morals. Not everyone is convinced by Kleingeld's argument, however, a few scholars have contended that although Kant came to denounce the brutality and injustice in how slavery and colonialism were practiced, it does not follow that he unambiguously rejected <clears throat> the very institutions of colonialism and slavery. <clears throat> Sorry. Moreover, Kant's positions about colonialism and slavery on the one hand, and his racial views on the other, may very well be mutually independent to begin with, so that he can be <clears throat> entirely against those in institutions while retaining his racist views. Yet another group of scholars, such as Charles Mills and Lucy L.A., have pointed out that regardless of whether the very late Kant changed his mind about race, we still have to contend with the fact that he published and taught racist views through 1780s, a decade that saw his central critical works, including the groundwork and the second critique. So one may ask, given that Kant was a racist, at least through the 1780s, how does that affect our reading of his core moral doctrines? One common assumption underlying this question is that racism contradicts Kant's professed moral universalism. Klangelt distinguished two camps of scholars precisely by their responses to this supposed contradiction. The first camp represents the majority view, which attributes inconsistent universalism to Kant, 
That is, he holds both a universalist moral philosophy and racist views. Most of scholars who subscribe to this reading is somewhat, but not too bothered by the perceived inconsistency. On the assumption that moral universalism represents the solid core of Kant's philosophy, which is not only stronger than his racism, but also contains resources for correcting it. The second camp is represented by Charles Mills, who ascribes to Kant a consistent but inegalitarian view. On this reading, Kant did not really intend his moral philosophy to be universalist or egalitarian as its wording now suggests to us. Rather, it excludes non-whites from the true personhood that is accorded with moral respect. In my view, however, the very assumption of contradiction underlying this whole debate is problematic. Here's one way in which Mills describes the apparent contradiction between Kant's purported moral universalism and his racism. On the one hand, there is unqualified universalism, according to which all biological humans, including all of the races, are normatively equally human or for persons. On the other hand, there is Kant's racist particularism, which views the races, of black, the races of Blacks and Native Americans as natural slaves. Most major critics never challenged this claim of contradiction. They take the, the alleged contradiction as a given and focused, on, focused their attention on figuring out whether we should simply bite the bullet and admit that Kant indeed contradicted his own moral philosophy with his racist views, at least through the 1780s. My view is that there is really no contradiction between Kant's moral universalism and his racist claims about non-whites because they pertain to fundamentally different aspects of his philosophical system with distinct methodologies and references. On the one hand, moral universalism, insofar as it belongs in Kant's pure moral philosophy, refers to rational beings as such in abstracto. That is, as Kant puts it in the groundwork, in total abstraction from the nature of the human being and from the circumstances of the world in which he is placed. On the other hand, Kant's racial claims refer to human beings in concreto as empirically situated embodied beings who live in climatically different regions of the earth. As such, those claims belong in Kant's anthropology and physical geography. To be more specific, there are two contrasts here. First, there is a contrast between pure morals and anthropology, with the latter specifying the conditions of applications, application for the formal. So Kant says, the system of morals as pure philosophy needs anthropology for its application to human beings. It is up to anthropology, namely, to investigate the subjective conditions in human nature that hum hinder people or help them in fulfilling the laws of a metaphysics of morals. In particular, it would deal with the development, spreading and strengthening of moral principles and with other teachings and precepts based on experience. A further contrast to be made is between the human species as a whole, which Kant often refers to as the human being to indicate unity and the mere aggregate of individual humans. Anthropology proper is concerned only with the formal. So Kant says, anthropology as a science seeks to know the human being according to his species as an earthly being endowed with reason to that extent, this science is not a description of human beings, but of human nature. Accordingly, and this is an important caveat to keep in mind for the purpose of my talk, what's true of the entire species is not thereby true of individual members of the species. 
As Kant puts it in the idea for a universal history with a cosmopolitan aim, in the human being as the only rational creature on earth, those predispositions whose goal is the use of his reason were to develop completely only in the species, but not in the individual. This distinction between human species as a whole and individual humans also correlates with Kant's distinction between anthropology proper and physical geography. On the one hand, anthropology, strictly speaking, is about the general conditions under which the human species as a unified whole may reach its final destiny through various stages of development. As Kant puts it, the sum total of pragmatic math, uh, anthropology in respect to the vocation of the human being and the characteristic of the, his formation is the following. The human being is destined by his reason to live in a society with human beings and in it to cultivate himself, to civilize himself and to moralize himself by means of arts and sciences. On the other hand, physical geography attends to how human beings around the globe differ from one another in ways that are relevant to their progress or lack thereof. Racial difference is one of these differences, which is a subject that properly belongs in physical geography. Although this doesn't stop Kant from incorporating his physical geographical account of the purported racial differences into his writings and lectures on anthropology. Here's a relevant passage. The discovery of what kinds of germs lie latent in humanity gives us at the same time, the means that we have to apply in order to hasten the unfolding of these natural predispositions. Despite the unity of the human species, there is still a difference of races to take up whose special character belongs to physical geography. To sum up this big picture, the relation between Kant's pure moral philosophy, anthropology and physical geography can be understood in terms of different levels of abstraction and specification. At the most abstract level stands pure moral philosophy which treats human beings, qua rational beings as such, in abstracto. Next comes anthropology, which treats the human species or human nature in general as endowed with various germs and natural predispositions in service of humans, humanity's moral vocation. Physical geography, by contrast, treats the variety of individual humans around the world as belonging to different races, nat nations, etc., each of which supposedly has its own unique character. One of Kant's central views here is that all humans can be divided into four basic races, and that uh, although all races qua humans share the same original germs and predispositions they are not equally equipped with the inner conditions necessary for full development of those germs and prepositions. <clears throat> In the rest of today's talk, I will flesh out this view by looking at Kant's account of laziness, which he sometimes treats as a special mark of savagery. I will begin with an overview of Kant's basic account of laziness with respect to human progress in general. I will then consider the way in which he racializes laziness as a physiological state marked by diminished life power or drive, a state that he attributes to Native Americans in particular. To begin, Kant sometimes presents laziness as a universal and natural human propensity. Such a propensity may not develop into an actual inclination, however, because it can be suppressed by other circumstances. Now, Kant is interested in laziness precisely for its role in human progress. 
The humanity's vocation, in his view, lies in moralization. To get there, the human being must first leave the state of nature, which Kant often describes as a state of savagery. Having left that state, the humanity must be cultured, then civilized, and finally moralized. We have come far in culture, Kant asserts, but still haven't done much in terms of civilization and almost nothing with respect to moralization. What has laziness to do with all that? Well, because a human progress requires hard work. Interestingly, Kant distinguishes useful and useless kinds of laziness, depending on whether it's conducive to progress. The useful sort of laziness is field repose, which Kant prints as one of three natural predispositions in the human being, along with cowardice and falsity that are necessary in order to maintain the species. By contrast, a state of laziness is useless and in fact contemptible in Kant's view, if the propensity for repose outweighs everything whereby all attributes become useless in his view and therefore also the whole individual. Kant describes such a state as one of, in, one of insensitivity, laziness, useless or baseless, baseness, wherein one never earnestly pursues anything and would at best act without driving force. This sort of laziness is in Kant's view contrary to both the right and the end of humanity in our own person. So the useless sort of laziness must be suppressed if the humanity is to progress toward its destined perfection. This can be done, Kant argues, only under the condition of culture or the civil state. His reasoning goes as follows. Through culture, the needs of the human being become great. And this was also a tie that linked human beings more firmly to one another. Thus laziness was fought against and the human being was required to be industrious and hardworking. The civil state is therefore the only condition in which all, of the, all the natural predispositions of the human being can be developed. The key concept here is needs. What Kant has in mind is not just any needs, but artificial needs, which one can have only in a state of culture. By contrast, in a state of nature or savagery, the human being does nothing other than that to which nature and necessity drives him. Like animals, he is driven to activity by pain, by hunger, and so on. By Kant's standard, such activities do not count as genuine work or industry. Besides useless laziness, savagery is also marked by lawless freedom, which Kant contrasts with the kind of freedom that characterizes the civil state. Civil state, Kant states, Civil freedom, Kant claims, includes the law or the restriction of the freedom of an individual in order not to, not to disturb the freedom of another and an authority that applies the law. By contrast, the freedom of the savages is barbaric freedom in Kant's eyes, namely freedom without laws and force. Kant traces this lawless freedom to certain arrogance and laziness. The savages also work little, he, can, he claims, for they think that freedom consists in laziness since work after all is coercion. The lesson Kant draws from this account of savagery is that the human being must leave such a state. He says, as little as it is to be approved that the human being always remain a child, just as little is it to be approved that the human being always remain in a state of savagery. Rousseau also did not want to say that the determination of human beings is the state of savagery. 
but that the human being should not seek his perfection of his state in such a way that he sacrifice all advantages of nature by chasing after the civil advantages. This state of savagery serves only for the plan of education and government through which such a perfect state can be achieved. In this way, Kant can use the notion of savagery to conceptualize a plan of education. This is when he highlights the importance of discipline. The human being must, Kant argues, be so disciplined that he is accustomed early to subject himself to the precepts of reason, lest he retain a certain savagery throughout his life. The reason is that savagery cannot be taken away and negligence in discipline can never be made good. Now, the question that interests us, interests me at least here, is whether besides this general account of savagery as a hypothetical state that every human being metaphorically starts from and must be disciplined out of, Kant also racializes savagery. This question emerges from Charles Mill's racial contract. Mill distinguishes two notions of savagery. The first is a hypothetical one, which serves for theorizing about civilization. If this notion has any reference at all, it's a European state lost in the past, if it ever existed in the first place. The second notion of savagery represents an actual state attributed to certain non-Europeans. Such a state is seen as literally materialized in a wild and racialized place. The literal savages are deemed childlike, incapable of self-rule and handling their own affairs. And their alleged savagery is viewed as so deeply penetrated, the door to civilization barred. According to Mills, classical contract theorists, including Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau, all racialized savagery in the way just described. That is, they theorized about social contrast, at least with a tacit, tacit racial logic or an underlying racial dichotomization of civilized and savage. This racial inflection, Mills adds, is even more pronounced in Kant. Underpinning the Kantian contract, according to Mills, is an explicit racial, rational, and moral order, a color-coded racial hierarchy of Europeans, Asians, Africans, and Native Americans, differentiated by their degree of innate talent. I think Mills was mostly right in his conclusion about Kant, but he moved too fast in his reasoning. One question he neglect, neglected to consider is what it would take for a philosopher to racialize savagery. My view is that this racialization requires two conditions. First, the philosopher must have a racial classificatory system that divides all humans into various racial categories with the so-called savages and civilized Europeans belonging to separate races. Second, he needs an account of how certain features of savagery are properly racial, not just in that allegedly they happen to be manifested in a race, but in that they will remain constant in this race across generations and across environments. In these terms, there is an important difference between Kant and the previous contract theorists, especially Rousseau. In the interest of time, I, won't, I will not go into the details of Rousseau's non-racialized account of lazy savagery. We can talk about it during the Q&A if anyone is interested. Now, to understand how Kant would racialize savagery and its characteristic laziness, we'll have to begin with his basic theory of race. The key question that drives this theory is how it's possible for members of the same species to acquire such strikingly different features from one another, some, some of which are hereditary. Kant's answer, very roughly speaking, is 
that such differentiations are made possible by germs plus climates. First of all, all humans supposedly belong in one species by sharing a single original phylum. This original phylum is said to, to contain genes and natural predispositions which allowed ancient humans to survive anywhere on Earth. As Kant puts it, nature equips her creature through hidden inner provisions for all kinds of future circumstances so that it preserve itself and be suited to the difference of the climate or the soil. Those inner provisions come in the form of various germs and natural predispositions that lie ready in the original phylum to be on occasion either unfolded or restrained. In case anyone is eager to celebrate the fact that Kant treats all humans as having the same origin, it's important to add that he's more interested in what differentiates them than what they have in common. He defends the supposition of a single origin primarily because in comparison with the alternatives, it best explains differences, especially racial differences. To work out the specific causal mechanisms underlying such differences, Kant then turns to a theory of climate, according to which there are four radically different climates in terms of the basic properties of sun as hot or cold and of air as dry or humid. He looks at properties of air and sun because he believes that these most deeply influence the generative power and produce an enduring development of the germs and predispositions. Now, Kant thinks that skin is the part of the human body that most evidently attests to what he calls the self-help of nature by means of a certain organization. And that four distinct color, skin colors, white, black, yellow, and red, were formed as adaptive responses to four radically different climates in which the ancient humans had to reside and survive for a prolonged period of time. For example, Kant speculates, black skin was formed due to the need to precipitate certain harmful chemicals, ir chemical irritants in the blood, such as iron and phlogiston. Kant also holds that skin color is the only necessarily persistently or irreversibly hereditary trait that is not part of human essence, namely it's contingent with respect to humanity in general. To back up this claim, Kant invokes observations about humans who are transplanted from one climate to another, for instance, when the black population who are indigenous to the sub-Saharan Africa are transported to Af America or to Europe, they will retain their distinctive blackness, so do their offspring. A second piece of evidence Kant uses to support his claim about the necessary heredity of skin color is that a couple with different skin colors always produce offspring with a hybrid or mixed skin color which is not the case with the other physical traits, such as eye color. Now, to the extent that only a necessarily hereditary feature can establish a race, Kant finally arrives at a fourfold racial division by skin color. They are white Europeans from humid cold, copper red Americans from dry cold, black sub-Saharan Africans from humid heat, and olive yellow Indians from dry heat. From the perspective of natural history that Kant is using here, this racial differentiation is rigid and irreversible. That is, once a race has taken root and has suffocated the other germs, it resists all transformation just because the character of the race has then become prevailing in the generative power. To sum up, here's the picture of Kant's theory of race with respect to humans. At the root is an original phylum that's shared by all humans. 
the germs and predispositions contained in that phylum eventually developed into four races as differentiated by four persistently hereditary skin colors. So far as Kant is concerned, what he's got here is a very potent explanatory model. We can find analogs of it in other parts of his philosophy as well. In particular, he uses it to talk about the possibility of human development. He says, there are germs for greater perfection innate to human nature, which could well be developed and humanity must achieve the degree of perfection for which it is determined and for which it has the germs within itself. What this proposition has in common with Kant's account of racial division is the following picture. The given germs and predispositions are only potentialities. How they will develop or whether they can be developed into their destined perfection depends on certain conditions. In this way, the conditions can make all the difference. With that note, let's return to Kant's account of savagery and of laziness in particular. Let me, let me begin with a nod to Charles Mill's claim that there is in fact a distinction in Kant's work between merely hypothetical or historically past European savages and literal non-European savages. Kant's go-to example of the latter is Native Americans. In the perpetual peace, for, for instance, he compares the medieval European and the American savages both being savages in terms of their supposed attachment to their lawless freedom. This association of the so-called American savages with the historically past medieval savages is telling. It suggests that in Kant's view, the putative savages now living in America have never made any progress. And this supposed lack of progress is not a mere accident, a mere accident accident by his analysis either. Rather, rather, it's an expected result of a peculiar sort of laziness that he attributes to them as a race. The, the laziness in question is a kind of physiological laziness. Generally speaking, this sort of laziness is a physiological state characterized by what can cause a blunting of energies or powers. The Americans, Kant writes, Kant writes in his first essay on race, has a natural disposition that betrays a half distinguished life power, allegedly due to poor acclimatization. The observation that Kant uses to support such an assessment is that the red or American slaves in Suriname, then a Dutch, uh, Dutch plantation colony in South America can be used only for laborers in the house because they are too weak for field labor. This by Kant's analysis is not due to any shortage of coercive means, but because the Americans generally lack power and endurance. With this analysis, Kant is alluding to a contrast between the red and black races he is more specific about the contrast in some of his notes and lectures on anthropology. He tells his students, for instance, that the American people acquires no culture, it has no driving force, because affect and passion are absent in it. They also do not care for anything and are lazy. By contrast, Kant continues, the Negro race are full of affect and passion they acquire culture, but only a culture of slaves. That is, they allow themselves to be trained as they are sensitive, afraid of beatings. One of the key terms in this striking passage is uphecton. Literally, this term signals animal training. When applies, applied to human beings, it means the taming of our natural animal independence without which one would be wild. Training is therefore merely negative, Kant tells us, 
by means of which man's tendency to savagery is taken away. The same passage also suggests that to be susceptible to training, one must satisfy two inner conditions. Namely, one must have certain drives on the one hand and affects and passions on the other. Lacking such drives, affects, or passions, a human being is untrainable and will forever remain a savage. Now, again, the question is whether Kant racializes that kind of lack by treating it as a persistently hereditary and irreversible trait of the race of, Amer of Native Americans. Kant signals an affirmative answer to this question most clearly in his response to George Forster's second transplanting hypothesis. Rejecting Kant's rigid racial division, Forster reasons that because it takes indeterminably long time for skin color to form under the influence of a climate, one cannot conclude definitively that it will not evolve into a different color in a new climate through imperceptibly small changes over another indeterminably long period of time. If one assumes with Kant that the first human beings developed a particular characteristic after prolonged acclimatization in one environment, why can't one also, Foster asks, foresee the event of a second transplanting or engender a new alteration of that characteristic in another climate? After all, there is neither a priori proof nor definitive empirical evidence against this possibility of a second transplanting. Kant recognize, recognizes that this argument by Forster is the most important counter argument against his racial division. His response is to double down and insist that once certain germs in the original phylum were developed in the population to suit a given climate, nature indeed paid no heed to a transplanting afterwards. Kant offers two observations to support this claim. The first observation is that the gypsies, after residing in Europe for as long as 12 generations, still perfectly retain their Asian Indian olive yellow skin color. The second observation is that when some of the already adapted inhabitants of the old region of warm climate were driven to the new region of cold climate, they, Kant claims, have never been able to bring about in their progeny, such as the Creole Negroes or the Indians under the name of the, the gypsies, a sort that would be fit for farmers or manual laborers. Kant's footnote to this statement contains an instructive passage that connects up with his above mentioned claim about the Native Americans lack of drive. He says, in addition to the faculty to work, there's also an immediate drive to activity, especially to the sustained activity that one calls industry, which is independent of all enticement and which is especially interwoven with certain natural predispositions. Indians, as well as Negroes, do not bring any more of it, this impetus into other climates and pass it on to their offspring than was needed for preservation in their old motherland and had been received from nature. This inner predisposition extinguishes just as little as the externally visible one, namely skin color. The far lesser needs in those countries and the little effort it takes to procure them demand no greater predispositions to activity. Notably, the backdrop to these remarks is the debate between the pro-slavery plantation owner, James Tobin, and the abolitionist reverend, James Ramsey. Referring to an anti-abolitionist tract by Tobin, Kant gullibly repeats Tobin's testimony that the formerly enslaved, 
<clears throat> Once freed, become hawkers, wretched, wretched innkeepers, lackeys, and people who go fishing and hunting, in a word, tramps. The long passage of just quoted is Kant's attempt to explain the alleged phenomenon. The gist of his speculative speculative explanation is that Blacks lack the immediate drive to sustained activity as a result of their acclimatization to their native environment. As Kant already said in his first essay on race, humid warmth results in the Negro who is well suited to his climate, namely strong, fleshy, supple, but who, given the abundant provision of his motherland, is lazy, soft, and trifling. While Blacks allegedly lack any immediate inner drive to sustained activity, Kant holds that they can nevertheless be externally driven or coerced to do hard field labor because they are sensitive, afraid of beating, and so on. The story is quite different with respect to Native Americans, however. In pushing back against Forster's second transplanting hypothesis, Kant also doubles down on his claim about the Native Americans' extreme weakness and hence their inability for culture. He writes, hardly another reason can be given than their poor acclimatization for why this race of Americans, which is too weak for hard labor, too indifferent for industry, and incapable of any culture, although there is enough of it as an as example and encouragement nearby ranks still far below even the Negro, who stands on the lowest of all the other steps that we have named as differences of the races. In so many words, Kant attributes two clim climatically induced traits to the race of Americans. First, they lack sufficient drive towards sustained activity. This is what I called physiological laziness earlier, which amounts to the blunting of life forces in Kant's view. Second, this race is also said to lack affects and passions, for which reason they're too indifferent and too insensitive to be externally driven or coerced to do anything. Meanwhile, the context in which Kant reiterates this assessment of the Americans suggests that he takes the traits ascribed to them as incapable of alteration through a second transplanting or by association with the supposedly exemplary colonizers. That is, he sees those traits as irreversible and persistently hereditary in this race as woven into the general power, the generative power of its progenitor. In short, Kant has racialized those traits. How does that matter, you may ask? Now, recall Kant's view of human progress that I mentioned earlier. When talking about how humans have come far in culture, but have not done much in civilization and even less in moralization, Kant is picturing progress after the humanity has left the supposed state of nature or savagery. This suggests that by seeing the race of Americans as literal savages who permanently lack not only sufficient inner drive towards sustained activity, but also the affects and passions that would have made them susceptible to external coercion, Kant has thereby excluded this race entirely from the train of human progress. What's more troublesome is that it does not seem difficult for Kant to accommodate this kind of exclusion. After all, as I mentioned earlier, his account of progress comes with the qualification that only the human species as a whole, not individual humans, shall reach or approximate the destiny of moralization. This qualification coupled with Kant's racial views leaves ample room for some members of the species to be excluded in a racialized manner from full participation in the progress. That being said, 
One may wonder as to whether this racialized exclusion is really compatible with some of Kant's other philosophical commitments. Setting aside the obvious question about the compatibility with his supposed moral universalism, which I do not question, one may wonder whether the racialized exclusion is even compatible with some of Kant's anthropological claims. In particular, as Catherine Wilson puts it, Kant's racism seems to be curiously at odds with his universal chimer or germs theory. Here's the relevant passage where Kant suggests that the chimer or germs for perfection are innate to all humans on account of their humanity, including the supposed savages. Innate to human nature are germs which develop and can achieve It looks like Huaping has lost connection, but she's just come back to the waiting room. Sorry, lost to me. Okay, Is that correct? Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know why my, my computer all of a sudden crashed. Um, I apologize. <laughs> okay, all right. I just want to skip to the end. Um, oh, I'm almost done. Let me see. Um, Okay, which one am I? Okay, this is the passage, right? Um, okay, all right, I apologize. Okay, um, so here's the passage. Is that where I stopped? Okay, great. Here's the passage. Um, so Kant, Kant wants to say that there is, um, there's innate, there are innate germ to, germs to all humans, qua humans. So here's the passage again. Innate human nature are germs which develop and can achieve the perfection for which they are developed. They're, de they're determined. Who has seen a savage Indian or Greenlander representing the race of Americans? Should he indeed believe that there is a germ innate to this same being? to become just, a, just a such a man in accordance with Parisian fashion as another would become. He has, however, the same germs as a civilized human being, only they are not yet developed. If the last sentence of this passage feels redemptive to you, it's important to note that there are two sides to Kant's climate theory. On the one hand, in emphasizing the unity of species, Kant posits that all humans, qua humans, come from one and the same phylum and thereby share the same original germs and natural predispositions. On the other hand, Kant holds that those germs and predispositions develop differently under different conditions, giving rise to more or less hereditary traits that warrant racial and other divisions. In these terms, we can resolve the tension that Catherine Wilson saw between Kant's racism and his universal climate theory, especially if we put emphasis on the side of his theory that stresses how different conditions can determine whether or to what extent and in what manner the universally posited germs may be developed in different individuals. Now, on Kant's view, some of the conditions that make all the difference in determining the individual outcomes are inner conditions. These include not only the immediate drive to activity and certain affects and passions, but also the ability to form abstract concepts and principles. Kant has a racialized account of how each of these conditions is allocated, even while granting the presence of the germs for 
perfection in all races, qua humans. It's this racialized allocation that leads to racialized outcome with respect to progress. To be specific, on Kant's account, the white Europeans contains all drives and talents in itself. The yellow Asian is incapable for forming abstract concepts or principles, for which reason they are stuck in the culture of arts without any further prospect for sciences, including philosophy properly so-called, or for true morals, which presuppose the ability to act from the abstract representation of moral principles. Blacks, as I mentioned earlier, are said to be, to be sensitive and fearful on the account of which they are trainable for the slave culture. Finally, the red Americans are said to be physiologically lazy and lack affects and passions, wherefore, they are incapable of any culture whatsoever. Now, this is the last slide. <laughs> uh, now let me conclude with a few lessons that I have learned from this study. The first lesson is that Kant's racial views may permeate his system in ways that are not obvious to us. Had I not studied his work on race, I would have been totally on board with what he, he said about savagery in general and about laziness in particular. This may be the case with many other topics in Kant, as I have learned as someone who specializes in Kant's theoretical philosophy so far. Now, now I know that when I work on a new theme from Kant, I should always be curious and ask myself, could this possibly be connected with Kant's racial views in meaningful ways? Second, not all non-whites are treated the same by Kant. Rather, he racialized each category of non-whites in a specific way, which in turn determines how each race is excluded from full participation in historical progress. This complicates the issue of whether the very late Kant indeed abandoned racism. What would it take for him to do so? Would it be enough for him to criticize the practices or even the very institutions of colonialism and slavery? I invite you to mull over this question. Kant's different views of the three non-white races also complicates the task for anyone who wants to tap into Kantian resources to combat racism today. As I have learned, as we have learned lately, anti-Asian racism takes a different form than anti-Black racism, for example, both today and historically. Maybe there is no generic anti-racist strategy. Rather, we have to be more targeted in thinking about anti-racism, which requires us to learn from the history behind each form of racism. Kant's work on race, in my view, contains useful clues in this regard. Finally, what has, to, what has been seen cannot be unseen, at least not easily. Once a racial classificatory system like Kant's is established and taken up in people's perceptual scheme, the genie is out of the bottle, regardless of whether we or even Kant himself might have wanted to, to put it back. We cannot undo the real life consequences of racial thinking without seeing race. As Ibram X. Kendi warned in his book, Stamped from the Beginning, there is a form of racism called colorblind racism. We should take care not to walk into it inadvertently with all the best intentions. I'll stop there. Thank you all for your attention and your time. I look forward to hearing uh, your questions, reactions, thoughts, and suggestions. Thank you again. Thank you very much for this very powerful talk. Um, now, following um, Huaping Luadla's own practice in her online teaching, we're going to take a three-minute break, in which during which you're encouraged to stretch um, 
do exercise. You can turn your camera off or leave it on as you prefer. Um, so we will start back um, at um, one minute past six. Yeah. So I hope you feel revitalized. Um, if you're back, please do turn on your cameras. If you are there, if you're willing to, it's nice to see you. Um, so I'll now open the floor for questions. Please could you re use the raise hand function, which is in the reactions um, set of options on the bottom of your screen in Zoom. And um, I would like to encourage you to um, keep your questions uh, as direct and to the point as possible. Um, the first question comes from Ido Geiger. Hi, can you hear me all right? Yeah. So let, let me first say that I enjoyed the talk very, tremendously. It was, it was absolutely great. Um, so you, I think, so you found a way of um, showing that Kant is not guilty of a, an inconsistency between his moral philosophy and his uh, racial uh, and, and his racism. And I'm wondering whether whether uh, the price at which you you uh, bought this uh, you know you removed this inconsistency is, is in exposing inconsistencies in his biological theory. So Kant says several times says very clearly and consistently that the only um, the only uh, racial mark or the only ra only property uh, defining race is, is skin color. Now you did show uh, evidence that he was sort of Speaking at, uh, of other properties such as uh, savage, laz uh, savage laziness as a racial property, but he shouldn't. Uh, and the reason, and so I mean, he says explicitly that you need um, that skin color is the only property uh, that he the, the only property observed that is without exception hereditary. And and the point of being uh, unexceptional. Uh, without exception is very important here because he wants a causal criterion which has no right which has no exceptions and so uh, so that's one one seems to be one inconsistency it would be enough to find you know a single uh, cultivated um, uh, black or a native american uh, to to reveal that that this shouldn't really you shouldn't have you shouldn't really speak of uh, laziness as a racial property and, and the, another inconsistency is that somehow it seems like there shouldn't be, uh, I don't think, I mean, I don't have the quote here, but it seems to be against this general uh, view of human uh, perfect, perfectionism, that there would be um, predispositions that would um, bar us from um, developing fully and achieving our uh, rational or moral vocation. And that that seems to be another inconsistency. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, those are excellent questions. Um, so I have actually thought a lot about the first question as well. Um, so there does seem to be on the surface, there is this kind of inconsistency, right? Uh, he's very specific, right? Like you said, skin color is the only, um, uh, you know, persist persistently hereditary feature. Um, I think what one way Kant might get around the inconsistency claim is that sure, um, skin color is the feature that establishes a race, um, but then the other features um, can be like a so-called collateral <laughs> collateral developments. And he uses this ex uses this expression that they are interwoven together with these other things. Um, that's I'm not sure that's a good response, but I suspect that um, he might say that. Um, the second one uh, about predispositions that um, uh, that seems to like hinder us. This is actually really interesting. Kant wants to say that um, what progress you need to make 
sometimes you, you just have to earn it. <laughs> um, and obstacles are almost necessary, you know, there for us to be worthy of any progress that we make. Now, laziness is a very pe peculiar kind of uh, uh, peculiar kind of feature. As the Khan said, laziness also has a useful function. So he thinks like you you have to have this kind of laziness. Otherwise, you're just gonna, the whole human species are gonna just work itself to death. And so he wants to say that the laziness was there to, meant to be useful, but somehow just kind of misadapted to a particular environment and then just developed into this useless thought. Now, of course, this actually comes up in his debate with Herder, right? About whether there can be anything that's purposeless. Um, I think Khan himself struggled with that question. So um, that's a step at your question, but um, I'm not sure that satis satisfies you at this point. We can follow up later, yeah. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Abraham Anderson. Thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed the talk also. I learned a tremendous amount. One thing you got me wondering about is why did Kant become a racist when so many of the authors he admired like Montaigne or Bale are so, are so far from that? But, and an answer that, that your talk suggested to me was that it's deeply connected with his hopes for and belief in progress. And I just wondered if you could comment on that or what thoughts you might have about that. Um, that's a really, complicated question. Um, there are many layers that you can kind of uh, add to that question. First of all, I actually, I'm writing a book on Kant, race and racism. I spent a whole chapter um, about the question, uh, about the very concept of racist. So even though I've adopted the language, right, um, you know, this is a standard question, right? Is a Kant a racist or is his philosophy racist? I personally, I'm actually very hesitant about going there um, because that's a very individualistic approach. Um, and I, in my book, I adopted this. Um, I, I, I got the inspiration from some race theorists who treat race uh, racism as ideology. So I rather see, like, I rather not ask whether Kant, you know, say like whether Kant is racist because then you have to get to his intention because there are philosophers who think that, um, you know, uh, it's one thing to be racially insensitive, it's another to be racist. And then the question is, what exactly is, you know, does it, what exactly does it take to be racist? It, and I cannot get to Kant's intention, right? Um, so I rather see Kant as someone who's this, like in this historical process of, um, of racist ideology formation. And um, he definitely picks up on the, the whole train of racial thinking, right? That was already in the 17, 17th century. So the, right now I'm writing a chapter on the 17th century discussion of um, racial features and racial divisions. And I think part of it, one lesson I want to draw is that Kant probably even walked into it thinking that it's pretty innocent. I think he began with, the, with this intention to study it as, as a natural scientist, right? He emphasized this perspective of so-called the investigator of nature or natural scientists or natural philosopher, different translations. Um, he wants to emphasize that he's looking at this as a natural scientist. And I think once he developed this model to explain racial differences, right? The model I said, this is a very potent model. And I think he started seeing, I always call like a con is like this a uh, man with a hammer who sees nails everywhere, right? <laughs> he worked out this model to explain the racial differences. Um, and in this way, he's, in this regard, he was in conversation with a lot of people before him who were interested in explaining racial difference. And then once he worked out his, this model, he wants to apply to other so-called phenomena, right? Including all these phenomena 
about you know uh, in in the more racist territory. Um, yeah, I'm not sure his hope for progress would be an impetus behind this. It's definitely connected. Um, I wonder whether you can say a little bit more about why you think you suspected that his hope for progress might be an, an, an impetus here for him to go the racist route. Right. Um, by the way, in speaking of him as racist, I wasn't making a moral judgment. I was thinking precisely mm -hmm. of the kind of racial doctrines that you were mm -hmm. speaking. Yeah. But um, what I meant was just that the typology mm -hmm. that presented us with so clearly and so lucidly, it, it seems to have to do with capacity for, for Aufklärung and for historical progress and all that kind of stuff. And so that suggests to me that, <clears throat> you know, <laughs> maybe one reason Montaigne doesn't engage in these things is that Montaigne in a certain sense, doesn't believe in that, you know? Not that he doesn't believe in the progress of technology and so on, but, uh, but the, the idea of moral progress uh, precisely is, is something that he, he, he wants to raise questions about. Now, of course, Kant has many questions about moral progress too, but at the same time, there is, as you say, this whole idea of of the, the, the progress of humanity as a species, you know, he's got this whole teleology that he's working out. And uh, it, it, it sounded from what you were saying, at least it sounded to me as if, as if the classification of the races was meant to illuminate and illustrate that. Yeah, okay, so um, thanks. So I think when you're just saying this, I'm actually thinking that um, now I can start seeing why the his I say his obsession with progress <laughs> his, his obsession with progress um uh, you know he was interested in um in physical geography right very early on in his career right um so one thing if you look at his writings about human history about progress and about all different uh, react all different views about whether you know humanity can keep progressing. One thing is that he recognized that there is this kind of human beings live on earth, right? They, they can bump into each other and they get in, in a war with each other. And um, so he thinks that geography is important, right? Early on, he, he differentiates, distinguishes different kinds of geography. There's moral geography, there's political geography, there's mathematical geography, which, you know, talks about possibility of earthquake and things like that. And, um, and that is his racial geography. He doesn't use this term, but, but um, he thinks that in order to progress together as humanity, you also have to be realistic that you're dealing with other human beings. And in order to deal with other hu human beings effectively um, and using each other as means for <laughs> human progress, you have to know who they are and you have to have some general understanding of their characters. I think that's why Kant is interested in the character of nations, right? And the character of races, because he realized that as the, tra the, the commerce and trade, right? Activities continued inevitably and then navigation, right? Seafaring, inevitably we would bump into each other. We have to learn how to deal with each other. And I think there was this kind of generally like seemingly innocent intention behind it, namely his insight that you have to know about one another in order to deal with one another effectively. And one of this piece of knowledge for him uh, happened like unfortunately was like, you know, taken from racial perspective. So I think in that regard, the, the progress uh, his his obsession with progress does play a big role here. Well, thanks for that question. That's great. The next question is from Eva Rebska Demanovic. Yeah, thanks hey, for Eva. this. Uh, hi, um, a great talk and uh, like a very illuminative and. Uh, what I really appreciated uh, was this. Uh, anti-racist remark about colorblindness in the end, 
to, <laughs> I'm going to incorporate it to in my talk uh, very soon. Um, I was wondering um, if you were thinking or if you were like going further with some of the approaches that go beyond uh, the question of uh, whether or to what extent uh, Kant was a racist or how rationalized his theory of phrases actually was. Um, and, and I just wanted to give three examples um, mm -hmm. of texts that uh, just um, go beyond because the, the, the work was so to speak already done. Although I think what, what you showed was, was very informative and very important. Uh, there is what Charles Mills, um, radical black Kantianism, mm -hmm. right? And then he tries to, uh, to develop a colorblind um, and non-colorblind uh, mm -hmm. uh, Kantian theory um, of justice, of morals. Uh, then there is the, um, this, um, Sorry, I, I lost the page because <laughs> constructive complicity approach of um, mm -hmm. Hussein Zadegan, right? Uh, where she just um, goes beyond uh, in your order to actually use Kant again, right? Mm -hmm. to, to try to, uh, um, the, the, the thing is that there is um, a group that uh, divides um, Kant's transcendental stuff from Kant's empirical stuff. And some people say they contradict, some people say they, they, they don't contradict. But in the end, um, a lot of them still think that it's safe to use the transcendental stuff, right? That it's mm -hmm. safe to, to use. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and those three, and the third is uh, Elvira Bastevich in her mm -hmm. um, a Kantian uh, theory of uh, like using public, public reason uh, mm -hmm. idea of Kant. Uh, that once the work is done, maybe we can um, actually save Kant, uh, Jan ideas in um, in order to develop or to, in order to contribute to anti-racial agenda. That's what I'm interested in. Yeah, that's that's uh, interesting. I mean, I've been thinking a lot. It's funny. I have been just to be <laughs> communicating with uh, Elvira. Um, about her work, and um, so there, there, there. Are, it's very encouraging that there are quite a few scholars, you know, working on this, and I'm learning a lot from their work. Um, and sometimes I think that in, tapping into our own personal experience uh, helps as well. And um, so I'm Chinese, and I've, uh, as if you, you know, if you have been consuming news, uh, you know, it has been like overwhelming for Asian Americans. And I've been thinking a lot about this. I, I was motivated to study Kant's views on race, partially because of my own experience. And um, I think there is a lot of work to be done. So for example, right, um, anti-Asian, like I mentioned, anti-Asian um, racism is a different form. And so far, um, you know, Asian Americans often are invisible. And except when they're singled out, right? <laughs> um, as scapegoats, easy scapegoats for other people's pains and in insecurities. And I think to combat that kind of racism probably takes different kinds of thinking. So lately I actually have been thinking a lot about um, Kant's view about the relationship between uh, a civil union within the state and the, the, the cosmopolitan union between the states. One thing Kant couldn't see was that now there's a, a different kind of an, you know, animosity, namely um, antagonism, namely racial antagonism. And sometimes it's, it's in an, a very uneasy relationship. Um, like, so, so in, in US, right, well, I'm just looking at US because I live here. Um, it's very interesting. On the one hand, US wants to have this kind of balancing dance with China. <laughs> so in so doing, we Chinese, uh, we, like not even just Chinese because a lot of people cannot tell who's who. They're just, we're just all Asians. Right. So when when U.S. get gets into conflict with China or Japan historically, who gets caught in between? Right. 
the racial, the Asian Americans within this democratic, supposedly democratic union. So the racial democracy within US and, and the country's international interest sometimes can get in the way with each other. And I actually find that part of Kant's work, political philosophy, particularly interesting to me to see how, um, you know, Kant's view about how, like there was this passage, there was this part in the idea um, where he talks about how a state needs to give more, you know, needs to give more freedom to its citizens so that it can be stronger internationally. So like, um, I think that kind of say um, framework is also very, very relevant here, uh, especially for thinking about the fate of Asian Americans in this country. Um, and I think that's, you know, again, there's really a lot of work to be done. And another thing was that I don't think most people talk much about, although there is really important work done by Peter Park on, in this regard, is that he as a profession has a lot and has a lot of anti-racism as anti-racism to do, namely how we teach philosophy, how we teach history philosophy. And Kant has this pretty racist <laughs> history of philosophy, which we don't talk much about. You can see it in his logic lectures, most of you uh, know, in, in particular, where he basically thinks that um, history philosophy can only begin with the Greeks because nobody else was was able has this had ability for this abstract concept or you know because the so-called orientals for example think um, only with pictures <laughs> we cannot form concepts so like as a result he think of history philosophy in a particular way and I think we're still in the grip of that picture of history philosophy, how we structure our majors and things like that. So there's work to be done here, right under our nose. So um, yes, thank you. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot more to be done. Yeah. Yes, and thank funny you. thing- Sorry, how Don't interrupt Eva. Um, we have six yeah. minutes and two more questions. So perhaps I'll take the next questions and then if we have time, we'll come back for follow-up if that's okay. Um, the next question is uh, Sophie Muller. Hey, Sophie. Hi, thank you for this talk. This was great. Um, I, I have a lot of thoughts on the relationship between race and progress, of course. And especially I was struck mm -hmm. by your second point about racializing savagery, where you said that it's a question about whether savagery remains constant in a race. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm a little bit afraid that that's maybe, I don't think it has to be that strong. I think it's enough mm -hmm. if you just say that there is a tendency in a race. I think if, you, if it has to be constant, then we would have to say that there is a constant mm -hmm. character in a race. And that mm -hmm. seems, I, I mean, it, it also becomes difficult with, with the textual evidence, I think, to say that, mm -hmm. that Kant is describing a current situation in a race and that that is then projected onto the future. I mean, I know that there are passages where he says that, mm -hmm. um, but wouldn't it be, I, I mean, I think it would, would, would save more of his coherence to say that, that he thinks of it as progress is more difficult for other races or he seems to suggest. So my, my question is basically, mm -hmm. is this laziness necessarily a constant in the other races or could that also be overcome historically? Also, because I'm thinking of the political aspect, like can we have a situation of perpetual peace if there's a group of people still in a state of nature, I think that would be very difficult. That's a that's a great question. Um, so I've actually thought about this as well. Like um, it's it's a different. I think it's kind of interesting. Um, the let me begin with the last bit you say about the political the 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 prospect of say um, you know true cosmopolitanism uh, like throughout the globe. Um, I'm thinking Kant actually himself was struggling with this. I think, I think he kind of built this trap for himself that he found difficult to walk out of, even in the metaphysics, metaphysics of morals. 
he was still wondering um, what to do with these people. He actually basically said, um, it's not a people you can form union with, civil union with. Um, because of this tendency um, toward lawless freedom and the lack of drive and the lack of what he calls like, you know, the insensitivity of these people means that um, right, in order to form true like, you know, cosmopolitan union, it has to, be, you, you actually have to be strong enough. I mean, I, when you look at, it, look at how he looks at the relationship between states, He's talking about relationship between the states. Strikingly, he often refers to these other people as peoples or places. He doesn't refer to them as states. So he might be struggling, like what to do with these people. I mean, he struggled with this about with this question in his exchange with Herder as well. This seems to be a purposeless people. <laughs> and and Kant basically thinks when he looks at history and he looks at progress, he wants to see like what natural provisions, what did nature give you? If nature didn't give you enough, I don't know what to do with you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I have to think a little bit more about how strongly his position has to be in order to, for this challenge to get off the ground. Yeah, thank you. I, I need to think more about this. Okay, um, I think we have time for one last question, um, which is from Antonio Monaco. Hi, thank you for your talk. And also, as you said, it's really useful for people working in theoretical philosophy. Uh, so thank you. And maybe you partially replied to my future question in your previous um, answer. But I want to ask you uh, if uh, you remarked the consistency of Kant's position, but I still see some uh, a methodological concern in part. All the reasons Kant gives for the nice civilization or even culture to the Native Americans are empirical reasons. So, um, which is, as you said, consistent, consistent with this um, uh, physical geography. But in principle, they are um, disproved. They are uh, they can be uh, disproved. So it is not um, kind of lacking caution, giving uh, uh, giving so strong conclusion um, in uh, or giving see this strong conclusion and uh, that have a, a consequence on moral behavior and even uh, in the relationship in states uh, states countries on the basis of more or, or um, not so strong empirical reasons. So that is more or less the question. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, that's a, that's a, another great question. So um, I actually, <laughs> it's actually helpful to have come from Kant, Kant's theoretical philosophy, as you said. Um, a few months ago, last, last year, I gave a talk on um, Kant's theory of testimony and um, so the question here is that, uh, as Ido pointed out earlier, uh, it's not as though Kant uh, was not exposed <laughs> to all this other counter evidence, right? Um, there were plenty of uh, reports to him about what these people are and things like that. But um, Kant has this view of testimony. Now, testimonial ex evidence is important, right? for his development of this kind of theory because he's never been to these places, right? Whose testimony do you trust? Kant has a whole theory about uh, credible witnesses. And he also has this theory, and Sophie knows this a lot more so, because Sophie works on uh, Kant's um, you know, uh, legal metaphor, right? Testimony is a legal metaphor. And Kant basically thinks that, think about what a witness, a witness is completely passive in the court who get like the judge calls you <laughs> and you get questioned. And Kant's view is that in order to have true observations, right? He said, you know, he's, he basically thinks what the kind of evidence he cares about is not just any fact you present to him, but rather what he considers as, um, as proper observations for him in order for something to count as observations to be relevant to his theory, 
um, they have to satisfy certain theoretical constraints, right? He thinks that you need principles, you need concepts, you need theories in order to observe. And this, I think this is really troublesome. I think, you know, if, if we're not because of his race, his theory race, I think I would be on board because I do believe that to observe, you need conceptual framework, you need theoretical framework. But when it comes to this kind of issues, I wonder um, whether like the obstacle is really, really strong, right? For, for, for Kant to be able to take a step back and say, maybe there's something wrong with my theoretical framework. But the thing is, I, could, I think that's why I think Kant's theory race is so interesting. Um, if you just look at it the philosophically, um, because I think he really kind of is the someone who spent all his life working on refining his theoretical system. And I, I very much suspect, I don't want to kind of speculate about his cognitive psychology, but I very much suspect that you know, he became so confident in his theoretical framework that makes him less, um, less alert, right, to the possibility that he's cherry picking data, for example, and he's really trying to fit a lot of observations into the theoretical framework he spent so much time working out. Um, and this is really a lesson, uh, you know, I want to draw from Kant. We don't know whether we're making the same mistake <laughs> because it's extremely hard to see through our biases. It's just a hard, and especially if we become more confident in our own intellectual abilities and the philosophical, uh, you know, rigor. Um, so that's probably only partial response to your question. That wasn't. No, no, answer. thank you very much. Thank you, it was thank you Anthony. Yeah. Okay. That seems a, a suitable point on which to finish the formal part of our discussion. Um, two quick announcements. Firstly, as usual, we will now keep the Zoom meeting open. Um, if anyone wants to have an informal chat, um, Huaping, if, if, you're, if you have time and you're able, you're very welcome to stay and that would be great if people have um, further things they would like to ask. And secondly, an announcement about the uh, next talk in our series, um, which will be on April the 22nd by Louis Felipe Garcia, who is here in the audience. Um, his talk will be called A Dynamical Concept of Matter, the Kantian Source of Schelling's Philosophy of Nature, with a response from Eckhart Furster. Um, so that's on April the 22nd. We hope to that you can uh, join us there. And um, yes, before we then sort of invite you to unmute yourselves and, and to chat informally if you do want to stay. Um, could I invite you all to um, give a round of applause to thank Wapping Lou Adler for this fascinating talk and discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This has been really special. <laughs>